of how the tank has determined the fate of nations in the past and how they will continue to do so in the future. Today's state-of-the-art tank, the Abrams, is a realization of over 4,000 years of armored development. Since first waging war against one another, men have dreamt of armor, a means of shielding vulnerable flesh in bloody battle. That dark dream was first realized by Egyptian and Mesopotamian warriors in 2500 BC with the invention of the chariot. The early attempts at armoring things were to, first of all, to prevent enemy weapons from doing damage to the people who were using the chariots. The second thing was to provide uh, mobility to that armored platform. So you have two things, you've got armor protection and mobility. In 217 BC, Hannibal, one of antiquity's greatest military generals, used armored war elephants to lead the Carthaginians against the Roman Empire. These fearsome beasts not only protected Hannibal's warriors, their mere appearance terrorized opponents. Leonardo da Vinci was the first to foresee modern armor. In the 15th century, he drew these remarkable plans for a portable manned fighting vehicle that bore a striking resemblance to the tanks of this century. But the technology required for such a machine would not be realized for over 400 years with the coming of the Industrial Revolution and the war it made possible. World War I. For the first time in history, men possessed mechanized weapons of mass destruction. The uh, enormous amount of artillery and machine gun fire that was present on the battlefield that just decimated soldiers by the thousands. The war would eventually claim over nine million lives. Most perished in trench warfare where soldiers attacked one another in an endless cycle of death usually with nothing to show for it. If an army possessed a weapon capable of crossing the trenches, they could break the deadly stalemate. During the first year of the war, a visionary officer of the British Royal Engineers, Ernest Swinton, saw an American-made vehicle that inspired a radical solution. Swinton had been looking at Caterpillar tractor tracks on artillery gun carriages. Swinton's idea was to put armor on the carriage that would go on those tracks and it could go across the mud and through the trenches and so forth. Old school military leaders in England immediately rejected Swinton's plans for the new age weapon. However, one man championed his vision, Winston Churchill, then the first lord of the British Admiralty. Navy ship designers completed a crude prototype, the Little Willie, in 1915. The project was so classified, workers were told they were building large water cisterns for troops in Egypt. Soon, the new secret weapons were known simply as tanks. Terms such as the hull, the hatches, and the deck reveal the tank's nautical origins and persist even today. By September of 1916, the world's first armored fighting vehicles arrived in France ready for battle. Called the Mark I, the weapon was like nothing seen before or since. The armored behemoth was 8 feet tall, 32 feet long, and weighed 28 tons. It was heavily armed with four machine guns and two powerful 57-millimeter naval guns mounted on rotating sponsons. Its 10-millimeter armor protected its crew from most enemy bullets. The Mark I's most brilliant technological achievement was its long tractor treads that enabled the vehicle to do what had previously been impossible, navigate muddy terrain and cross trenches. But the Mark I was primitive as it was revolutionary. The crew consisted of 11 people, four or five of whom did nothing but run around and oil the engine and try to keep it running. 
And then there was a crew on the gun, the, the Sponsons. It took three or four people to service those weapons. And there, there were two guys up in the top who apparently gave it some direction. The Mark I was so undependable, 50% broke down after traveling only a few thousand yards. Their cabins were so hot that crewmen often fainted. They were so noisy, communication was impossible. Not long after the Mark I drove onto the battlefields of World War I, the French introduced their own design, the Renault FT-17. Lighter and faster than its British counterpart, it weighed 6.5 tons, had a crew of only two, and achieved a top speed of five miles an hour. One of its most innovative features was a revolving gun turret. The British were looking at a land battleship, so they had large vehicles that were able to cross trenches with ease. The French were looking more at replacing the cavalry horse, so they're small and more maneuverable and much better for exploitation. On September 15, 1916, tanks entered combat for the first time when 36 British Mark I's crossed the enemy lines on the Western Front. Their mere appearance terrified German infantry. Tanks certainly had an effect on the execution of World War I. They were shocking to the enemy troops. The British tanks were humongous. It must have been uh, like the guys who saw Hannibal coming with the elephants. My God, what is that coming down, coming down the path? The tanks successfully led British troops 3,500 yards into enemy territory. It was one of the most spectacular victories of the war. In response, the Germans later experimented with armor, producing the monstrous A7V. Weighing over 30 tons with a crew of 18, it resembled a large armored box on a tractor chassis and was never used in the war. Meanwhile, hoping to capitalize on their new high-tech weapon, the British began planning the war's largest tank offensive. The battle would deliver one of England's only World War I victories and ultimately determine the future of the tank. With the initial success of the Mark I, the British Tank Corps believed the tank was the answer to trench warfare. Hoping for a clear and lasting victory on the Western Front, Allied commanders devised a revolutionary scheme. For the first time in the war, they would use a dense formation of tanks to lead a major offensive. Their target, a previously impregnable sector of the German front near the French village of Cambrai. The plan called for the infantry to follow close behind the tanks to exploit the breakthrough attack. After secretly amassing nearly 400 of the new Mark IV tanks, the Battle of Cambrai began on November 20th, 1917. Within four hours, the tanks had advanced up to four miles, suffering almost no casualties. However, the revolutionary weapon was successful only so far. After the initial drive through enemy lines, British soldiers immediately fell behind leaving the tanks vulnerable to German artillery and infantry, who knocked them out one by one. They had not provided the forces to follow up and exploit the effect of the breakthrough attack, so the whole thing uh, was kind of a waste of time. They did gain some territory, which the Germans promptly recaptured. And one of the primary armor concepts is uh, tanks work with infantry and they make a great team, either by themselves or much less effective. After the Battle of Cambrai, besieged German leader Kaiser Wilhelm personally inspected several captured Mark IVs. It was now clear that the Allies had gained the upper hand in technology and in the war. It was to be the last time Germany would allow its enemies the same advantage. While the Great War ended in 1918, its use of tanks ignited a debate over how to best deploy these new weapons in future conflicts. Many envisioned the tank as a powerful offensive weapon of the future. Others argued that tanks should continue to play a defensive role, protecting infantry. 
The tank was very much in World War I an infantry support weapon. Some uh, visionaries, General Patton was one of them, saw a greater role for tanks, but it wasn't to be, largely because the thing was not very, really quite mobile enough to do that. This debate among the Allies would slow the development of armored warfare in the West for two decades. That was 20 years worth of bickering between a bunch of uh, deeply entrenched bureaucrats, each one believing that his, his version of the story was correct. The United States Army believed until, really until World War II, that the uh, infantry soldier, the individual rifleman, was the primary weapon system on the battlefield. That ignores the enormous potential of the tank. While armored development in the West stagnated, a new German leader was orchestrating one of the most remarkable economic and military revolutions in history. Fueled by a lust for revenge after Germany's humiliating defeat in World War I, Adolf Hitler quietly set out to build the world's most menacing army. Next war, advanced armored fighting machines would be at the forefront of Germany's arsenal. September 1st, 1939, the face of war is changed as the Nazi forces slash into Poland. Hitler's stunning invasions of Eastern Europe in 1939 and Western Europe in 1940 were the quickest and most efficient in the history of warfare. His success was due to a brilliant new tactic called Blitzkrieg, or lightning war. For the first time, all tank formations, or panzer divisions, led an invasion. Unencumbered by slow-moving infantry and supported by the Luftwaffe and mechanized troop-carrying vehicles, enemies were overwhelmed by a concentrated formation of fast-moving tanks. One of the interesting things about the Blitzkrieg concept was they put the armored forces forward as a, as a spearhead going on ahead of the infantry and everything that came along behind. The Germans were the, really the only ones to seize on, the, on the, the singular opportunity that the tanks and armored forces represented. When Hitler's panzer divisions invaded France in 1940, the French were unprepared for the devastating new strategy. France had no inkling of what was happening to them, and their tank forces, which was the only anti-tank capability they had, were spread so widely across the front that they couldn't concentrate them, and the Germans just went through them like a sieve. The shocking success of Germany's Blitzkrieg challenged the West's strategy that viewed the tank as a defensive weapon. But more importantly, Hitler's invasion revealed how far behind France and the Allies lagged in armored development. If they could not catch up, Hitler would soon invade England and beyond. British Mark IV tanks were outfitted with crude radios in which they used Morse code to communicate. Modern marvels then and now will return. In 1940, Hitler's bold armored invasion of Eastern and Western Europe caught the world by surprise. France's large tank force was neutralized. Britain had only one armored division. And the U.S. armored cavalry, consisting of only 66 tanks, was forced to train with trucks and use bags of flour as dummy ammunition. The only tanks American forces empl employed in battle in World War I were those French-made and British-made tanks. So you're dealing with relatively ancient technology here and with technology that we knew was pretty fragile on the battlefield and we needed to do better. As Hitler set his sights on England and beyond, the United States and its allies desperately sought to catch up. I ask this Congress for authority and for funds sufficient to manufacture additional munitions and war supplies of many kinds to be turned over to those nations which are now in actual war with aggressor nations. With a massive $21 million investment in tank production, 
the U.S. rushed to design and manufacture a new armored fleet. During World War II, the tank evolved faster than in any period before or since. Between 1940 and 1942, the U.S. became the leading supplier of newly designed tanks to its European allies, even though it had not officially entered the war. December 7, 1941, would change everything. The attack on Pearl Harbor immediately turned the United States from wartime suppliers to full-time combatants. Meanwhile, Germany began an all-out invasion of Russia with a staggering four million troops, 2,000 aircraft, and 16 elite panzer divisions. With 3,300 tanks spearheading the attack, Hitler was confident he could conquer Russia's major cities before the winter of 1942. All went according to plan until the German army encountered a surprise. The Soviets had quietly developed what many considered to be one of the greatest tanks ever made, the T-34. The ingeniously designed medium tank boasted an 85 millimeter main gun and a top speed of 32 miles per hour. It was also the first tank to employ sloped armor, a brilliant innovation that caused German shells to bounce off it. After suffering some of their first defeats of the war, Hitler's generals began calling the T-34 the best in the world. Relying on their T-34s, courageous Russian soldiers stopped Hitler's armies before they captured Moscow and other key cities. That delay put them at the mercy of another deadly enemy, the Russian winter. By spring of 42, Germany had lost one million men and 1,600 tanks in some of the most brutal fighting ever seen in any war. As Hitler's army stubbornly fought on their eastern front, German engineers quickly redesigned their tanks. Borrowing extensively from Russia's T-34, they produced the mighty Panther, which became Hitler's most effective weapon throughout the remainder of the war. With its superior firepower, protection, and mobility, the Panther revolutionized ground combat once again. With a 700-horsepower engine and extra-wide treads, the 43-ton Panther could traverse rough terrain and reach speeds of 28 miles per hour. Its long-barreled, high-velocity 75-millimeter cannon was capable of taking out enemy tanks from as far as 1,000 yards. Bringing this large a gun forward on the battlefield uh, enabled them to outshoot just about anybody. Panthers were almost invincible in battle. Air attack was the most effective way to destroy one. A year later, Germany introduced World War II's most feared tank, the Tiger II. Heavily armored and weighing 68 tons, the Tiger II was less mobile than the Panther, but carried a formidable 88 millimeter gun, which could reach an incredible one and a quarter miles. Although Germany produced only 500 Tiger IIs, they became the kings of the battlefield. The uh, 88 millimeter dual purpose cannon, as it was called, was actually designed to be a, uh, an anti-tank gun. Uh, but it, uh, its most devastating effect was as a, an anti-tank gun on a tank. Marvelously well-designed and very effective cannon. We had nothing like it. In an attempt to keep pace with Germany's sophisticated armor, the U.S. Army began mass-producing what would become the best American tank of the war, the Sherman M4. The Sherman M4 had a maximum speed of 25 miles per hour and a low velocity 75 millimeter gun. Fire. Holding a crew of five, it proved reliable and easy to operate and maintain. It was also highly adaptable. Attachments easily turned the M4 into rocket launchers, hedge cutters, and amphibious vehicles. 
Despite its many assets, it had thinner armor, weaker firepower, and was slower than its German or Russian counterparts. There was really no way for us to, to put better armor on them, given the kind of engines we had. 500 horsepower was the, about the limit. And the guns were borrowed from everywhere, from the Navy, from the air defense forces, from wherever. So our tanks in World War II were more or less of a, a hodgepodge of whatever was available. Remarkably, the inferior Shermans often defeated German tanks in battle. But the key to their victories had less to do with quality than it did with quantity. America produced a staggering 50,000 Sherman tanks between 1942 and 1945, compared to Germany's 8,000 tanks. We outnumbered them. In the end, we outnumbered them. And that was our, that's, that's the industrial mobilization mentality. All you have to do is outnumber the other guy. Deploying a vast number of men and machines, the Allies achieved their most significant victory of the war on June 6, 1944, D-Day, the largest land and sea invasion ever attempted. For every five men put ashore, there was one combat vehicle. Sherman tanks played a vital role in reclaiming most of occupied Europe. But it would be six months into the invasion that the Sherman would meet its ultimate challenge. In response to the deed, most brilliant offensives. December of 1940, secretly gathered section of the. Hitler gave the order to attack. Within hours, German tanks smashed through the Allied front lines. Hitler's last gambit for victory would become known as the Battle of the Bulge, referring to the bulge in the Western Front forged by his panzers. Hitler aimed to thwart the D-Day invasion by breaking through enemy lines and securing the Belgian port city of Antwerp, the primary supply line to the Allies. After his successful surprise attack in the Ardennes, Hitler dispatched several panzer divisions towards Antwerp. Another division was sent to the Belgian town of Bastogne. Seizing Bastogne, a junction of roadways that connected the Ardennes with Antwerp, was key to Hitler's plan. Bastogne had seven major roads going through it, like the spokes of a wagon wheel, and it was necessary for the Germans to take that to uh, keep their attack going because their supplies going ahead and their wounded coming back. With the Air Force still grounded due to poor weather, the Allies turned to their tanks to secure the vital road junction. Brilliant tank commander General George Patton and his 4th Armored Division were ordered to leave the German border 157 miles away and make a run for Bastogne. Leading one of Patton's companies was 21-year-old Captain John Whitehill. We knew it was a big one, or they wanted to pull us out of a, a combat situation and move us that far. They fed us on the highway, uh, they served us coffee by just handing a can from the, the truck to the tank, and we never stopped. Military strategists estimated it would take the 4th Armored Division three to four days to reach Bastogne. Realizing that the Germans would take the town first, the U.S. Army was forced to rush battle-fatigued foot soldiers from the 82nd and the 101st Airborne Divisions to defend the town until Patton's tanks arrived. 19-year-old Private Don Burgett was one of the first members of the 101st sent in. They shipped us up because we, at that time, were the only available experienced combat men in the area, the 82nd and the 101st. We didn't have ammunition. We didn't have enough weapons. Some of my uh, men in my squad had just a knife. Uh, one man in my squad had a stick he'd picked up. 
And as we was walking down the road, he kept hitting the stick against the ground, and he said, I'll have a rifle tonight. And this is the way we were sent in uh, against an entire army of tanks. And we had, uh, we had knives and sticks and rifles without ammunition. On December 19th, hours before the fall of Bastogne, the first soldiers arrived. By the next morning, they were surrounded by the most lethal armored machines in the German arsenal, the mighty Panther IVs and Tiger IIs. When we ran into enemy tanks and you're on foot, it's like being in a group of prehistoric monsters. I was under a Tiger tank and it stopped right on top of me and I was uh, really concerned because I have seen them they know you're there, I've seen them lock that track and they spin around and around and they grind you into hamburger and they grind you right into the dirt. But he was there probably about 20 seconds and I thought he was there like 20 minutes, but he went on. By December 23rd, the fourth day of the battle for Bastogne, thousands of besieged soldiers had lost their lives. Patton's tanks which should have already arrived, were delayed by worsening weather. If they did not get there soon, it appeared that the surviving soldiers trapped in Bastogne would be lost. The German World War I tank, the AV-7, was made by the Daimler Company, the present-day maker of Mercedes-Benz. After four days of brutal combat, Private Don Burgett and the soldiers of the 101st and 82nd Airborne continued to hold the Belgian town of Bastogne. But their situation was becoming increasingly desperate. The Germans had 38 divisions in this battle, and Hitler had ordered nine of the 38 against us, our one division. We were uh, basically trapped or cut off like the hole in a donut. Temperature had dropped to 10 below. We were out in the, in the fields uh, with no overcoats, no gloves, out of food and out of ammunition, and it was getting kind of lean at that time. Meanwhile, help was nowhere near. The 4th Armored Division was further delayed by poor weather. In the beginning, it was decent roads, but as we neared Bastogne, they became snowy and ice-covered, and it became difficult to travel. When we stopped the column on the highway, the steel tread tanks, they acted like sled runners, and we would slide right off the road. After six days on the road, Patton's 4th Armored Division finally reached the body-strewn outskirts of Bastogne. On the morning of the 25th of December, we kicked off from a point several miles south of Bastogne, and all this time we're hearing about how they're being uh, squeezed and so forth. And uh, it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon of the 26th that they said we're going in. German tanks would now be tested against the powerful Panthers and Tigers. The German tanks were superior, but they, they fought with a different tactics, uh, where they would fight with five tanks and maybe 2,000 foot troops. We had maybe 12 infantry to each tank, and we fought tanks in mass, so we, we could keep them uh, occupied in the front while we snuck around and kicked them in the butt in the back. A tank had to maneuver around to the side and get in a shot to the side or to the rear. Uh, it was really just dumb to fire on the, the front plate of a Panther tank. The strategy of using inferior Sherman tanks in superior numbers began to take its toll on the mighty German armor, but at a heavy price. For the most part, we were able to destroy the Panther tanks. Uh, we did it at a cost of uh, lives of American soldiers, but we were able to do it. As Patton's tank forces wore down German defenses, the weather finally began to cooperate. The fog lifted. It was like a movie, you know, all of a sudden you look and there's, there was sun, sunshine everywhere, gla glaring off of the snow. And we were in the woods and I saw my buddy, some of these little shafts of light coming down like a cathedral almost. You know, you're in this woods, this forest, and they would stick their hands in and out of these little shafts of sunlight. 
Uh, it was a real blessing, and we knew that uh, the outside would be coming. After being grounded for 10 days, the Air Force finally joined the fight for Bastogne. Everything came in at one time. The clouds were gone, the sun came out, the 4th Armored came in, our Air Corps came in, and um, it was almost like dancing in the street. Patton's 4th Armored Division broke through the enemy lines. The Sherman tank emerged victorious against German armor. The only way to get in there was to be mobile and move in with some protection. And we were able to do that. And without having armor, I don't think it would have helped much to have a group of foot troops walk up that road. I don't think they could have penetrated. The armored cavalry finally joined forces with the soldiers who had held Bastogne. Together, they fought one of the most courageous battles of the war. In the Battle of Bastogne, the 4th Army and the 82nd and 101st lost over 8,000 men. Well, I think they, they would like to be remembered that uh, what they died for wasn't lost. But I think it... <laughs> With what, the way the world's going, I don't know, you know, but I, uh, I think the, I don't think they would like to uh, be remembered for the uh, glory and the honor, because there's no glory in war. I think they would like to be honored. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I think they'd like to be honored. Weeks later, the Battle of the Bulge was over. Within months, Germany surrendered. I don't think that we could have won the war over there without the tanks, because we had speed, the mobility, and the firepower. Foot troops could never have moved that fast, and you had to move fast. You had to maintain constant contact with the enemy. You didn't dare let have a gap where they could stop and regroup. You had to keep intimate with them all the time. And that's the only way we could do it, is with tanks. The tank had revolutionized combat more than any other land weapon in the war. But another implement of war brought about the end of World War II, this time from the sky. On the morning of August 6, 1945, a B-29 named Enola Gay dropped an atomic bomb over Hiroshima, Japan. Three days later, a second exploded over Nagasaki. The advent of atomic weapons convinced many U.S. military leaders and politicians that future ground wars would be decided from the air. Some declared the tank's heyday over. The period after World War II, nothing happened in the tank development business. The prevailing wisdom was that the big bombers and the nuclear weapons were going to defend the country. And this, this led to, a great, again, a great controversy about armies versus air forces this time instead of infantry versus tanks. During the next three decades, the tank played a diminished role in most battlefields. In the Korean War of 1950 to 1953, modified Sherman tanks were used with little success due to military unpreparedness and difficult terrain. The tank briefly came to the forefront during the Israeli Six-Day War in 1967. Israel's gigantic British Centurion tanks soundly defeated Egyptian forces in the deserts of Sinai in one of history's most fabled tank battles. The following year, tanks became a symbol of oppression. The Soviet Union used them to suppress social unrest in the streets of Prague during its invasion of Czechoslovakia. In 1989, Chinese T-59 tanks were again used to squash political uprising, this time in China's Tiananmen Square. By the 1970s, military strategists were ready to sound the tank's battlefield death knell. 
but not Army General Creighton W. Abrams, who was named Army Chief of Staff in 1972. Drawing on his first-hand experiences as a commander under Patton in World War II, Abrams called for a complete makeover of the tank, the first since the 1940s. One of the things that my dad had to do while I was chief was to say, look, we've got to start all over again, and we've got to focus on three things. Crew protection, accuracy and precision with lethality, and, and mobility. It was really a back to the drawing board, uh, trying to find new concepts, uh, any of the improvements that could be made, and incorporate them into a totally new tank. This futuristic tank, the Abrams M1, named after the general who inspired it, would revolutionize the future of armored warfare. It would meet its first challenge in 1990 during the Gulf War. On August 2nd, 1990, Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein invaded the tiny oil-rich nation of Kuwait. In response, a U.S.-led coalition mobilized the largest combat force in the history of warfare. Operation Desert Storm. Using sophisticated Patriot missiles and high-tech bombers, the U.S. Air Force conducted nearly 70,000 sorties over Iraqi targets. After three weeks, firmly entrenched Iraqi troops continued to occupy Kuwait. After this intense bombing, Desert Storm Commander General Norman Schwarzkopf realized that to liberate Kuwait, he would have to launch a ground war. The battle's most vital weapon would be the Abrams M1. Though untested in combat, it was designed to meet General Abrams' three requirements of a modern tank. Crew protection, mobility, and lethal accuracy. The fully electronic Abrams tank is equipped with ballistic computers, laser rangefinders, and an infrared vision device that enables the crew to see at night. An independent thermal viewer allows the tank commander to identify targets independent of the gunner. With Abrams' sophisticated thermal sights, crews can see enemies from several kilometers at night or during inclement weather. In the process of specifying what we needed to be able to do at night so that the whole battlefield belonged to us day and night, we did some experiments with that and figured out that we could, in fact, uh, fix the gunner and the tank commander so they saw the same thing, give the driver a better view, or give the loader something he could see to view and shoot with. To destroy virtually any land target, the Abrams is equipped with two 7.62 millimeter machine guns, smoke grenade launchers, and a 50 caliber machine gun. Its potent 120 millimeter cannon can hit a target almost three miles away. An independent turret stabilizes the gun mount so that it can accurately hit targets while moving on any terrain. The Abrams tank incorporates fire control systems that are much superior to anything that had ever been developed before. And some would say uh, the current Abrams fire control system is superior to any other tank in the world. We had a fire control system that said in excess of 90% of the time, we were going to hit what we were shooting at and kill it first time. To protect the crew, the Abrams is shielded by the most sophisticated armor ever developed. Made from depleted uranium, it has a density at least two and a half times greater than steel. It's very similar to a quarter. It's different types of metals put together, some soft and some harder, to provide a, a wafer-like or, or wave of hard and soft protection that gives it a much better ability to withstand shots. Despite its 63-ton weight, it is exceptionally mobile. Boasting the most powerful tank engine ever built, the Abrams can move at speeds up to 45 miles per hour. 
It uses a turbine engine, much the same engine that's used in a helicopter. This tank can literally be driven at speeds that would cause the track to fall off. It, wor it worked like a charm. We had never had a turbine in a ground application, turbine that big, 1,500 horsepower in a ground application before. As they entered Desert Storm, the Abrams tank did battle with Iraq's most formidable tank, the Soviet-made T-72. During several dramatic battles, U.S. tank crews successfully located and destroyed enemy tanks before the Iraqis even detected their presence. During the Gulf War, uh, one of the nicknames for the Abrams tank was Whispering Death because it does not have a tank-like sound. By the end of Desert Storm, Iraqis' 4,000 tanks had been reduced to fewer than 100, while the U.S. lost only four. Desert Storm was so quick, so decisive, uh, that the international community is still reeling from the impact of this tank. It was such a quantum leap in capability. And, and it brings such great confidence uh, to this very difficult business that we do. The best evidence, I guess, that I can cite uh, was a statement by a, a, an Iraqi uh, brigade commander who said something to this effect, that the, uh, the United States Air Force bombed us for three weeks and we lost a few tanks and some people. Then along came the 2nd Cavalry and we lost the whole brigade in an afternoon. Due to its success during Desert Storm, the Abrams has convinced many military strategists of the tank's necessity in the modern age. Mobile protected firepower is what the tank is. And the tank is the, is the centerpiece of mobile protected firepower. The tank is the key to battle success as long as, as, long as you can uh, foresee it. It has caused the nature of land warfare to change. That's what happens whenever you have such a dominant piece of technology introduced in, into mission and battle. Uh, it causes the nature of warfare to change dramatically. From the primitive Mark I to the groundbreaking armored fighting machines of World War II, to the high-tech Abrams, tanks have helped determine the fate of nations. Until the next evolution in armor, it appears that the tank will remain in the forefront of battle. And as long as there are wars, man's dark quest for armor will continue.